my name is Teresita Blanco, the Isis sister, and today we're going to start astral look. This is chapter, chapter 4, part 2. In the final room, she finally saw Alida and she was gingerly washing her hair and body while Cole inside a large silver basin and using a sponge, she gingerly removed all of the colors and markings she had worn for her performance and the spots on her shoulder and the black sash in her waist were, pro were proving most petulant and her human forehead had a more uniform white coloring and Ingrid looked at Alida in an effort to see some familiar resemblance and they had the same mouth, the same cheeks and the same mole in the left shoulder and nothing else. And they would have been a, they would have had identical body that however Alida was in a stronger shape in comparison to her anemic do nothing a fraternal twin sister and Ingrid gave a step back and closed the curtain behind her while she pondered on what to say to Alida. And her sister said, If you are done staring, why don't you make yourself useful and help me untangle my hair? Taking the hairbrush, Ingrid started to gingerly brush Alida's hair in the fashion her hand made them used to, and it was a slow process, but Alida's wet hair was, was, uh, was being straightened, and while performing this mini task, Ingrid was able to notice a pair of small wings in Alida's back. And they were glossy, glossy and transparent, like the wings of a flying fish, and the islands were black with red dabs. And when Ingrid concluded this time, she placed a nearby tower over Alida and since Alida did not have any shoulders, it felt listlessly inside the basin. And getting out of the water damn trembling, Alida said, Don't bother, I still, I still have some skin to shed. And moving her body about, she made her way towards the heavy wooden sofa and using a lot of support, she then shed the rest of her skin. And when she was done, Alida bothered to look at her interlocker and still trembling from the cold, Alida opened her mouth wide and she yelled, Help! There's a creep in my room! And the girls came from the other rooms and ganged up on Ingrid and they started pulling on her hair and scratching her face and arms. And soon the dwarves and the humans of the started biting in at Ingrid's legs and the gunners creatures and other folks joined in and eventually subdued Ingrid, leaving her battered and bruised and none of the wounds and blows were done in earnest, rather, rather the circus folks were just having fun at her expense. In title with jump rules, Ingrid was brought before the ringmaster to pass judgment upon her and by now the ringmaster was done and the hands were folding the tents and preparing to leave Mita and the ringmaster at the time was inside his green bird and wild and he was sitting by a candle cradling in a fruit bag with a pacifier and the tip of the pacifier was carved from a pineapple and the man was using it to feed his little critter and when and when his under is knocked on the door the bat opened his eyes and started looking about and wiggling his large ears and another ringmaster said, What is it now? Can you see I'm trying to get Batsy to sleep? Bats are nocturnal, <laughs> Pike said in his underling. The ringmaster Pike knew uh, was an albino fellow and when he was four he was kidnapped from his home and sold to the circus and he practically did as a slave and was and was the amusement of traveling folks and after ten years he was eventually dragged down by his mother and it was a bloody affair and since he had lived and see here, as he was a general distrust of anything remotely looking humanoid, and showing his shoulders, Mute said, I, I have met with success many times before, and what's more, I cannot allow myself to change my sleeping habits for the benefit of my little bad friend. <laughs> so he tries to put a bat to sleep with nocturnal. You gotta sleep whether you want to or not, little bat. So one else could take care of Batsy in the morning, said another, said another fellow. Never, said Mute, putting Batsy close to his face. And then he said, if you had no other business, then show yourself out. Oh, yeah, there was a queen was found bothering Alida, said the first, said his underling. That's the second time today. What have you What have you to say for yourself, young man, said Mute in a condescending tone. I am not a young man, I'm a girl, yelled Ingrid insulted. Her current dress had her toes so well defined, and only a blind person could have confused her for a man. Sure you are. That still doesn't give you the right to to pair on a lady actor, said Muse, petting the back petting the back's chin. Say what you want, but as far as I know, only men can be considered uh, can be considered creeps. And since I'm a girl, it is not my fault for being in my sister room, explained Ingrid, refusing to take <laughs> to accept blame. Get out, uh, you little uh, you crazy now, dear Mew. Jail Muse, and together with the circus performer, Ingrid was unceremoniously kicked out of the circus. If I see you again here, uh, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be, I'll put you six feet under, said Muse before the party. 
and Ingrid limped towards Anne. After half an hour, she managed to drag what remained of her herself to bed, and she wondered where was Loki, and, where was he, and why hadn't he protected her. And while Lucy conscience, she pondered on Loki, and the morning came, and with her said the Troll Queen. And outside her castle, she had the appearance of an ebony shepherd made shepherdess, and her hair was short and curly, with a, which only drew more attention to her cold, expressionless black eyes. And Ingrid's wounds had been tended to by her mother's magic, and despite not having any more wounds, Ingrid's head felt heavy, and she could barely master the will to sit up. Her mother said, Ready to come home? You already saw your sister, and based on your wounds, it is safe to assume that your sister wants nothing to do with you. I never managed to reveal my identity to her. She is rather skittish. It is not my fault for not being more direct. Started saying Ingrid when her mother gave a small sign and got up and left the room. And Ingrid always had how her mother never bothered to listen to a word she had to say. And outside the room, the troll queen passed by Loki who was waiting for it and he asked, Do you need me for anything else? I suppose not. You manage with the best of your abilities, but some things are far. I just paid it to not go the way you desire, said the troll queen sadly. Faith. That's only the problem for people who lack the strength to enforce their free will unto others, retorted Loki. If you have a problem with faith, then you disappoint me. The troll queen tapped her bare foot on the floor, illustrating her slight annoyance, and the situation had gotten out of her control, and this appeared to bother her quite a bit for somebody who liked to have everything under her control, and in the end she decided to step away from the entire situation. And she returned to Ingrid's room just to say, You can come home when you feel like it, or not. She slammed the door behind her and left Ingrid quite disturbed. And the troll queen was an icy maiden, and at times Ingrid wondered if she was showing any, if she was capable of having any real emotion. And this was the first time she had seen her mother display something which resembled anger. And as the queen returned to her palace, there was a faint smile painted on her lips. And it was not till late noon when Ingrid rose from her lethargy, and she would speak. She would speak with her sister Alida as soon as she saw her, and since the main show was done, Alida was idle. And other small scale shows were taking place but none that required her presence. And Ingrid found her in an abandoned temple of Erua, and Alida was staring at the fishes in the sacred pools. And her hair was pulled up and tied with one black ribbon and a white striped one. And her long hair was curled and made to fall towards her left. And she was wearing a, a green ballerina outfit with a black and white ribbons around her waist and her lower half was covered by, by a leather zebra patterns, sock of sorts. And with her hair up, Ingrid was able to see her ears and as far as Ingrid knew, snakes had no ears and, and were there for death or so she fancied. And Alida's ears were large and pointy like the, like the ears of a dragon. And Alida could see Ingrid standing behind her, just staring at her, studying her like some bizarre animal. And at the moment both sisters were identical in their stubbornness, and the hour silence was broken by the sound of an even footsteps approaching. Time? Six minutes. Both sisters turned to look upon the creature that was Loki, and in his current force he had the bulk of a bull with the legs of, uh, of a black panther, the tail of a lion, and an, over, and an oversized face of a man with super tiny ears, with small horns, and a head, and very large wings. And the one of his eyes were violet, and the retinas were listless black, the same as his fur. And cut into the fur was a swirling pattern of silver. He came and tugged at a little skirt, and then he said, See, you can't help it, can you? This has gone far enough, don't you think? Then looking at Ingrid, Loki said, Speak already, I haven't got all day. Alida, I am, we are sisters, said Ingrid. Alida gave a quick smile and response. It was at that moment that Ingrid realized that Alida knew all along who she was, and Alida then said, Since when have you known? For a couple of years, it seems, answered Loki. She can speak for herself, can't you? And I would appreciate it if you stay quiet for a little while, said Ingrid, now running her eyes. Fine, you're definitely doing so well before before my interference. Do I would advise to get to the point already, said Loki. Well, I want us to get to know one another and maybe be friends since we are twins as well, said Ingrid. And what if we're not related, will you still want to speak to me then, said Alida, facing Ingrid. Ingrid was at a last for word, and Alida continued as thus, just take the hint and let's both return to our lives, shall we? And Alida started slithering away as hundreds of stars raced through Ingrid's mind. And she was about to perform something foolish and desperate when she saw Loki's bizarre face shaking sadly. And before leaving the temple, Alida hid behind a column to give a final look at Loki. And there was just something positively bizarre about the creature that he was pretending to be. And when Alida left, Ingrid sat down by the pool and she started 
right in circles in the water using her index finger and from time to time she would sign or moan and Loki sat down beside her and he started wetting his paws in the water as well and looking at Ingrid he said cheer up hairball it seems to take time mm, she was nothing to do with me language Ingrid can't say I blame her answer Loki you find your sister and she was nothing to do with you get over it and go home already there's no reason to wallow in quail just when things don't go your way well, don't go your way how could she not want to be with me? She should be happy to have a family member who wants to be with her and care for her and be friends with her, complained Ingrid looking up. I think she already has more than enough people to do that for her, said Logan. Is that so? How I envy her, whispered Ingrid getting up. And she brushed her dress and her knees and she made her way back to the inn. And she thought of all the while. And there was a present thought in the back of her mind. Brother, time? Four minutes, I told you. When Logan in his bizarre form peeped his head through the window, she realized it. You monster, she yelled as she smacked his head with the meager furniture inside the inn. And after a couple of wins, his wings stretched like hands, which restrained Ingrid. And the girl was still pitching a fit, insulting him, and eventually the innkeeper came to see what was the matter. And when he saw the creature, she left the room yelling, and soldiers soon came in, and the two accosted Loki with their spears and arrows to save the damsel in distress. And since so the situation had gotten out of hand, Loki flew up into the sky against the sun and disappeared from their sight. And on the meantime, Ingrid was sobbing, and her face was contorted into a mass of terrible fury with what hid behind her clenched fists. And as far as the soldiers were concerned, the girl was crying because of fright she had suffered, and one gallant fellow even offered her a bit of brandy to calm her senses. And Ingrid took the bottle and drank a quarter of it, and with her fury somewhat abated, she left the inn to wander aimlessly around Misa. And none of the soldiers bothered to see her off, and during her state of delirium, people were like shadows to her, and from time to time, a godly person or a queen would approach only to be frightened by the death mask she wore. And some semblance of life emanated through her shoulder in the form of a light poking, and turning slightly around, she grimaced as she saw the stick figure, the stick walking figure. And the creature was wearing a short, tight, length dress with its skirt filled with different layers that resembled a jellyfish, and the illusion was coupled by a long pearl bead that emanated from the dress, and the creature had no need for dress. Why it sported an attire was a matter of debate, and it was as pointless as jewelry as they said that were starting to become popular among Dragon King. Ta? Two minutes, thirty seconds. The train was started by a certain Ahi, and other dragons soon followed in suit, and regardless, the steel figure led Ingrid to the Pugilist Club. As it was nearing dusk, the mermen from the dust were currently inhabiting the club. And when normal sailors visited the bullets and bars of sound that the mermen went to the Pugilist Club. And when in his eye was a blue hair maid, was a blue hair color maiden with flaming red eyes, and she genuinely drew a rapier at Ingrid who took it without giving it much thought. And her opponent fought effortlessly, just mindlessly blocking or parrying each of Ingrid's strikes. And though it annoyed Ingrid somewhat, in time she forgot all of her problems, and the rest of her suddenly was a nice change of pace uh, than the alternative of drowning in drunk stupor or sharing the bed with a filthy sailor. And when her sparring was conclu concluded, Ingrid asked the obvious question, if you fight with sword, why is this called a pugilist club? And you having fun? Why must you nitpick at everything? You could fight with your fist if that is your preferred weapon. I put one like the saber, which goes well with this aquatic theme I'm going for. And this little club of us encourages all forms of fight or pugilism, if you would. And I do for one engage in a good old Irish standard, and we should try it if you have a mind for enduring a bit of abuse, she said coolly. <laughs> I must politely decline, said Ingrid, returning the weapon, if she was not too keen on discovering what, uh, what an Irish standard was. <laughs> And as she left, Ingrid, Ingrid like Loki could not help but notice that the club was tragically empty and it had a nice vibe about it and the people were friendly and they were made us drinking tea and discussing books in a cushion chair by the fire. And the thing that Ingrid particularly liked was the fighting team painted adorning the walls in the arena. So they made the walls look busy and overcrowded and the realistic words were masterfully crafted. Time? Uh, one minute. And the, and the one which made Ingrid linger as she departed was a sketch featuring a horse and a jack fighting. And the father was behind the home in a pinch for trying to figure out how to handle the situation. And there was something comically pathetic about the entire thing which made Ingrid smile. And she had made peace with the entire situation and meanwhile Loki was busy meddling. And since the drug queen's contract had been fulfilled, he was free to act as he desired. Right. And at the moment, he felt like helping Ingrid a bit. Bye bye and God 